What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music, the Discovering Bob Dylan podcast. I am Joe. I'm here with Dylan. We are just running through Bob Dylan's discography, trying to teach me the ways and the the glory of Bob Dylan. And we are we're we're getting right through his discography. We're all the way to 1967. We've we've done the classics. You know, we've done the acoustic classics. We've done the big three, the electric trilogy, bringing it all back home. Highway 61 revisited and blonde on blonde. And I've found myself somewhat converted into a fan or at least a respecter and admirer of Bob Dylan and his music. But I think that was the easy parts. Like, I mean, is it really brave of me to like the electric trilogy? Like I am one of millions, every single critic, every single, you know, musical person in the music criticism sphere. You know, everybody likes this stuff. There's there's some naysayers, you know, they pop up in the comments, like we were talking about earlier, uh, before the show, me and Dylan. But for the most part, you know, people really like Bob Dylan. They really like his music, his lyrics. It's not hard to see why that is. So we're we're moving on into a little more foreign territory for me, some stuff that I have not heard before. And we're taking a little detour. Uh, you may be expecting a review of John Wesley Harding, but you are mistaken because before John Wesley Harding comes the basement tapes, which did not see the light of day, at least on the official release until 1975 but were recorded before John Wesley Harding and after Bob Dylan's motorcycle crash, which we will get into more here in a minute. So we decided, you know, let, let's tackle the basement tapes first. It's a very big part of Bob Dylan's life and music career and kind of helps explain John Wesley Harding uh, a little bit. And, and you have the band, very important. They'd be popping up and uh, 1968 as well. So this is a, a pretty seminal record, kind of blew people's minds in 1975 when it was finally released. Uh, but here in 1967, Bob Dylan gets into a motorcycle accident and uh, take it away, Dylan. How are you, by the way? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you for finally asking. <laughs> We've been talking for 10 minutes here. That's no, okay. Any Anything could have happened in my life and you wouldn't know, but here we are. Um, yeah, very important stuff here. Um, Blonde on Blonde, the record we just talked about, that's recorded in February 66. And he goes out on tour to Europe and Australia in April and May with a band called the Hawks from Canada. Um, this is the band that he toured with in late 65 as well. They consist of five musicians named Garth Hudson, Levon Helm, Richard Manuel, Rick Danko, and Robbie Robertson. I say Canadian, Levon Helm is from America, but um, I believe a month or so into that initial tour, Levon left the group because uh, he couldn't handle the consistent heckling that they were getting from people who were upset that Dylan was touring with Electric Band. So by the time they reached this tour, uh, Mickey Jones is behind the kit, who I just learned about an hour ago, went on to be a founding member of uh, the first edition, Kenny Rogers' first group known for uh just dropped in um so the most famous concert takes place on may 17th 1966 at the free trade hall in manchester england where right before the closing performance of like a rolling stone someone in the audience yells judas to which dylan responds i don't believe you you're a liar turns to the band and says play it fucking loud and they indeed play a very intense, amazing version of Like a Rolling Stone. Uh, for years, this is bootlegged as the Royal Albert Hall concert, which they played Royal Albert Hall like a week or so later. Um, in 98, it was officially released as the fourth installment, the first standalone installment of the still ongoing bootleg series. So you can hear all of this go down and... Uh, it's an amazing show. You can hear a pin drop during the acoustic set, and uh, the the band is incredible during the electric set. Um, anyway, a month or so later, June 20th, 1966, Blonde on Blonde is released, 
And just over a month after that, on July 29th, he crashes his motorcycle, almost completely disappears from the public eye. Second leg of the U.S. tour is scrapped. The documentary he's working on with D.A. Pennebaker is scrapped. He is done. And there are varying reports of how serious this accident actually is. Uh, but what better excuse to get the hell out of Dodge when you just can't take it anymore, which Dylan admits to himself. Uh, I forget what the exact quote is, but it's something along the lines of, yep, I got in an accident and I was hurt, but I recovered and I didn't want to deal with it anymore. Um, so that all happens up near his home in Woodstock, New York, um, which is also where the Hawks have a, uh, a place of their own. Joe, why don't you take it from here? What what happens after this? Bill and I have no friggin' clue. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, that sucks because we planned for this. <laughs> yes. Now they uh, they kind of get together. They're in the same place. They got the the big pink house. You know, Danko and Manuel have been invited to Woodstock to collaborate with Dylan on uh, the Eat the Document film. So they were kind of mingling uh, around the same time. And they started out in the red room of Dylan's house, just sort of informal recording sessions. And then eventually he moved to the basement, a big pink, the basement tapes. And uh, it it's interesting. I mean, it, it was set up and maybe this is true, maybe this isn't true. It's just kind of informal jams that, you know, these songs weren't necessarily ever going to see the light of day. So you do get this kind of intimate look into them just kind of jamming and goofing around. And when you don't have the pressure of, hey, I got to write a song for a record, you know, you can expand your sound a little bit. You can play some covers. You can bring back some, you know, blues standards and, and folk standards. And and it's just, uh, you know, this loose kind of jammy session. Um in the eventual 1975 release, there are possibly some overdubs and possibly some songs that maybe weren't actually written and played in 1967. Uh, it's another one where the, the story behind it is nearly as interesting as the album itself. Like most of Dylan's albums, there's a whole legend behind it. And, you know, you have one guy saying, oh, yeah, you know, this is definitely written in 1967 in this house. And some other guy saying, no, this was uh, 1969 from a completely other time. And someone said it was a 1975 track that ended up on here. So whether or not every single one of these songs was written in the basement of Big Pink doesn't really matter, I guess. So you, you have the band minus Levon Helm, who I think showed up for maybe one song or was on one song that eventually made it to the, the final album. He he shows up at the tail end of it. So they, they started this in early 67. I forget what, what month, maybe February or March. And they kind of just doing it on and off through September. And then he comes back around that time. Um, some of the songs, at least some of the Dylan songs would drum. There, there's no disputing all of the Dylan songs are from 1967. Everything that you're talking about are the band. So there's... 24 tracks and um i can't remember off the top of my head i literally just listened to it again this last week but somewhere between eight and 12 of them are just songs by the band um in some of those songs there's uh questions as to what was recorded in 67 what was recorded after that but for the dylan material some of the songs leave on overdub some drums on some of them, Richard Manuel was playing drums on. Other members uh, of the band were playing, you know, the band obviously notorious for being able to play every instrument and switching instruments. But yeah, I think from the original recording sessions, yeah, LaVon's really just at the, the tail end of it. You can hear um, the complete basement tapes um, as a part of the bootleg series, I think volume 11, 11 or 12, um, which don't worry, Joe. You and I will go through all 36 discs of it one day, track by track. That sounds great. Um... <laughs> but yeah, a lot a lot of the early stuff is, 
yeah, lots of covers of old country material, old blues songs, some R&B stuff. And then somewhere around the middle of the, the sessions, they they start kind of coming up with their own stuff. And um, a lot of funny, nonsensical songs, you know, you know, like like I've mentioned a few times before, this was the first Dylan that I ever heard. My very first mix CD included Yay Heavy and a Bottle of Bread and Please Mrs. Henry. And um, I have a massive soft spot for them and and other songs like that. Odds and Ends, Million Dollar Bash, Apple Suckling Tree. Just totally ridiculous, funny, lighthearted stuff. I love that the guy who wrote lyrics like disillusioned words like bullets bark as human gods aim for their mark make everything from toy guns that spark to flesh color christ that glow in the dark is the same guy that wrote i looked at my watch i looked at my wrist i punched myself in the face with my fist like you know, we've we've talked before about how crucial his sense of humor is to his writing and yeah towards the middle of these sections you know, on a, on a bunch of songs that he's not ever intending for people to hear. He's just totally tuned into his own lunacy. And then somewhere along the lines, he just starts writing some major compositions that um, a lot of them get loaned out to other artists. Um, obviously, you get uh, Nothing Was Delivered and You Ain't Going Nowhere, showing up on Sweetheart of the Rodeo by the Birds. Uh, Million Dollar Bash of All Songs shows up on Unhalf Breaking by Fairport Convention. Uh, Too Much of Nothing goes to Peter, Paul, and Mary. A bunch of different artists do This Wheel's on Fire. The band keep that in their back pocket for Big Pink. Um, and then they don't show up on this uh, particular release, but you can hear... A bunch of the demo recordings um this is when he writes i shall be released which the band also takes this is when he writes uh mighty quinn quinn the eskimo which man for man records a bunch of other artists record uh crash on the levee down in the flood is is taken by a bunch of artists so it's it's fascinating and um it, it to me just hearing these guys messing around and just sort of casually creating a brand new sound that would go on not just to inform other popular music of the day, but 50 plus years of popular music. Um, I mean, you can listen to so many rock artists from the early to mid 60s, Bob included, who are incorporating elements of traditional blues and folk and country, which makes up the foundation of rock and roll anyway. But there's something about this particular blend of styles that's so unique. You can hear it through so much of what can be considered Americana or roots rock throughout the last five or six decades. Um, and, and so much of that, you know, we need to give props to the Hawks, who are then renamed the band. And then, you know, themselves really put, I think, the biggest stamp on it the next year with music from Big Pink. So I have some some more thoughts on on the material here itself. Some of it positive, some of it not so much, but I... I am so interested to hear what you think of this record. Well, it is interesting, you know, if you've heard Big Pink, and I think most people watching this show have, yeah. uh, to hear the, you know, the roots of that sound kind of come to life. Uh, and, you know, these guys are so talented. And, you know, they'd be messing around and they'd be switching instruments and Bob Dylan would come downstairs with some lyrics and he'd be like, you know, hey, who, who's got a who's got some music for this? And that's how you got this wheels on fire. And yeah. Tears of Rage. And Tears of Rage. Yeah, right. I mean, Bob needs a musician to you know, come up with music for this. And however, you know, whether it's fate or just sort of a simpatico of these two, you know, the hawks aka the band and, and bob that they were able to get together and sort of carve out this new style it's very interesting uh you, you got to give a lot of credit to the band for this sound do wonder you know would bob have gone to that sound without the band there well i mean what was he working on you know what was his sound going to be for his next album there's so many like unanswered questions uh, but he ends up in the basement of Big Pink with the band, and it just, you know, 
It works. It totally works. I think the album itself is interesting. You know, it, it's very loose. Uh, it's very ramshackle, as we love to say. Uh, a lot of it sounds kind of borrowed from the 50s. You know, I hear a lot of like Chuck Berry and uh, older, older school artists. It's only in the 60s, but uh, going back to the 50s, for sure, for a lot of this. Uh, and I think the lo-fi production and engineering, basically just a tape player, you know, Garth Hudson did the, the production and the recording of it. And it sounds pretty darn good for just being recorded in the basement with a couple of mics that they borrowed from Peter, Paul, and Mary, I think. Yeah. Um, in in 1967, where yeah. home recording is not what it is today, and, and even professional recording to a, to a lot of degrees you know, isn't isn't even close to what home recording might be for a lot of people today. Right. Yeah. So the, the sound is very good for what it is. It's not quite Highway 61 Revisited or Blonde on Blonde level fidelity. Uh, but I think it works for the material. The the kind of the little vignettes and the funny little throwaway songs. Uh, it's interesting the way it's sequenced. You have more of those in the beginning until you get to the end of side two and you get Tears of Rage. Uh, which is obviously a major track. Then you start getting things like you ain't going nowhere and nothing was delivered and uh, this wheel's on fire. And I think for the most part, I prefer the band stuff than the Bob Dylan stuff here. I, I love when the birds do <laughs> nothing was delivered and um, you ain't going nowhere. Sweetheart of the Radio is one of my favorite albums of all time. The, these versions leave me a little cold in comparison uh I, I think the birds kind of have the definitive take on those I, I didn't look at this the list of who was writing things as i was going through but it kind of becomes obvious when you have a song like yazoo street scandal which was written by robbie robertson which is an incredible song it sounds amazing whatever they do with his voice is really cool uh, immediate standout and I found myself just kind of being like, okay, I, I really like the band stuff and I really can tell where they're going. Like it's, it's right into uh, music from Big Pink, which I think is a five-star album. And I probably like more than any Dylan album, to be honest, at least at, at this point in my life. And the, the Bob Dylan stuff is, is okay. I don't know. I like Million Dollar Bash better when, when Fairport does it. Uh, I like the, the major ones, Tears of Rage and This Wheel's on Fire, better on uh, music from Big Pink, like the, the Birds versions. And it, it, it's not all bad. I mean, there's nothing here I think is embarrassing or bad. I, I like the humor in um, Please Mrs. Henry. You got those like real saucy ribald lyrics. Lots of sexual innuendo on there. That's one. It's like, there's no way he was like, this is definitely going on one of my albums. I'm down on my knees and I ain't got a dime. Now I'm starting to drain. My stool's going to squeak. If I walk too much farther, my crane's going to leak. Look, Mrs. Henry, there's only so much I can do. Why don't you look my way and pump me a few? <laughs> and he starts yeah. laughing after it. Like he right. knows it's ridiculous. How, how do you not laugh <laughs> hearing that uh little stanza there yeah i i didn't get what all that meant when i was eight years old <laughs> no i wouldn't think so i, I mean, just knew it was funny <laughs> and and you have those and i think it works fine with the band stuff but i definitely feel myself like really into the band stuff and dylan's it, it's not like he's not there and not present and not a major part of this obviously but he almost seems like a secondary character at times. Uh, there's a couple ones where he's just playing acoustic and he's just doing little, some backup singing. So it almost feels like like a split EP or something where it's like Dylan in the band and like they're kind of doing their own things at times. And I know, you know, Dylan does the lyrics, Tears of Rage, which feels on fire. He does most of the, the lyrics on the album. Uh, but I'm I'm just really attracted to the band's performances on this. And I think, uh, you know, Garth Hudson's organ does so much great lifting on this. Really like Robbie Robertson's 50s-styled guitar throughout. There's some great piano. The singing, I think, from everybody is pretty good. Uh, Bob Dylan only does the um, kind of buffoon-ish 
parody of Bob Dylan vocals, I think on on one one song or two. So he sounds pretty good here. I like Crash on the Levee a lot. Really like Dylan's performance on that. I think it's my favorite vocals of his on the whole album. If it is him, I hope it's him. And if it's not, then <laughs> it's another strike against him. Now, yeah, uh, Crash on the Levee's great. Feels like a band album with Dylan there. Or but but maybe I'm just thinking that because I know music from Big Pink and this sounds so much like that that I'm sort of flipping those things around and interpolating where I should be saying Big Pink really sounds like a Bob Dylan album played by the band. No, I don't I don't think that that's necessarily correct. I, I can understand why you feel that way. It's it's also interesting, you know, to consider this collection truly as an album i mean for all intents and purposes this is a compilation you know i i don't know exactly how or why it became um considered canon like if, if you look at bob's list of studio albums you know he has 40 studio albums and this is one of them and there's another one in, in 73 that we'll eventually talk about just called dylan it's the same thing where it's like it's it's questionable because yeah this this wasn't like, all right, guys, you know, we're going to we're going to get together and create this collection of songs that's going to be released to the public. It had just been bootlegged for, you know, almost a decade. And then finally it was like, hey, let's let's do something with this. I think that makes sense. And I think that it's very much a case of a true like symbiotic relationship. This these were two different artists that needed each other at the same time like you you were saying you didn't know what direction dylan would be going in and i i think you you hear it here and then when we eventually get to john wesley harding um you'll also hear it there, there's still obviously some uh whatever you want to call it some some mysterious dylan wordplay you know some nonsensical stuff here and there but it's it's also distinctly different i think from the psychedelic stream of consciousness stuff that he'd been putting forth on the last few albums you know even with some of the silliness and some of the poeticism there's noticeably a lot more straightforwardness going on i think that some of that is a result of him taking a step back spending a lot more time with his own sort of domestic life. Uh, and then, yeah, also being with this band that is very interested in all of these sort of, you know, rootsy genres as well as rock and roll. Um, I think that he needed them and their sound. He needed to play with them sort of, you know, not necessarily reconnect with his muse by playing all these covers, although I think that that certainly helped. Um, and I think that they needed him as a performer and a songwriter to, you know, help get them where they were going to go to, um, especially Robbie from a, a songwriting standpoint. I definitely think they needed each other. And from a sonic standpoint, yeah, it probably sounds like a band record to you because it's it's the <laughs> band. <laughs> so um, and, and certainly, yeah, there's. You know, again, I forget exactly how many songs um, that it, it's just them. Dylan's not singing at all. And I'm so happy that you shouted out Yazoo Street Scandal. That is my second or third favorite track on the whole record. Um, it's it's sped up. I'm pretty sure that's that's all it is. I, I think there's a version of music from Big Pink from a few years ago that has the original unsped up track as a bonus track. And it's still really good, but it's not as cool as this. Um, I I adore it. Levon's voice on it is so so cool. Um, yeah, and a few other of their tracks are really great. I also really love "Ain't No More Kane." Um, I really really love uh, their harmonies on that. Um, I, the band's late '60s output and sound is among my favorite music ever created. Uh, music for Big Pink and the self-titled band record are. Yeah, two of my absolute favorite albums of all time, two of the most important records to, to my personal life. So um, hearing their material interspersed with Bob's, hearing them, you know, create the sound that was then utilized on those records is absolutely incredible. Um, and, and I think they do a great job with Bob. And there's some stuff on here. I, I, I agree with some of what you're saying. Um, 
there's some songs on here that I just don't think are in their strongest configurations. You Ain't Going Nowhere from a Bob perspective. He re-recorded it in 1971 for his Greatest Hits Volume 2 just as an acoustic thing um, with another guy playing bass and background vocals. And I much prefer that performance to this one. I prefer the Birds performance to this one. I like Crash on the Levee, but he also re-recorded that one for Greatest Hits Volume 2. I like that version better. He also does a live version in 2003 for a film that he was in called Mast and Anonymous, which is absolutely batshit fucking insane. And I cannot wait to talk about it to some degree. But he does a live version and that really cooks. I don't think he ever does justice to This Wheels on Fire. I think it's a great song, but the me- the version on music from Big Pink is light years better than this one for me. I, I think that's... Richard Manuel on drums on this version and he's just not holding it down for me it it sounds very very rickety which sometimes I really love that on this particular recording I don't love it but you know I'm not going to argue that you know this version of Tears of Rage is better because I don't think it is I think it's one of if not the greatest album one track one songs of all time from music from big pink but i actually think it is a really good performance of it i think that bob when you know richard Manuel's vocal on it it's like well what can live up to that but i actually think bob's vocal is pretty damn good on it i think that the band's harmonies behind it are great yeah i'm not going to say it's better but i still think it's very solid for me the highlight is going to acapulco absolutely i think that's bob's best vocal performance on the record very very soaring very passionate and when you get bob's passionate vocal with you know danko and and manual behind him equally passionate soaring above him i mean this is the first time we get background vocals on uh on a bob dylan record at which again we're going technically out of order here but you know bob has such a not just a unique voice but a unique delivery I mean, tr- he's you listen to so many of his songs and his delivery across any given chorus is never the same. So how are you going to harmonize with this guy? But some of the work that, you know, that Danko and Manuel do on this record is just unbelievable behind him. I think they sound great. Again, I have such a soft spot for this. You're going to come across, I, I bet we're going to have at least two people in the comments you come across, there's a certain section of Dylan fans that think the Basement Tapes is the be-all, end-all. Like, this is the most fascinating, interesting, real, quote-unquote, you know, this is just the, the, the mecca of all that is Western music, the Basement Tapes. I don't go that far. I It's a long album. You know, I need to be in the right mood for it there's a handful of tracks i'm not crazy about you know stuff like tiny montgomery and clothesline saga don't do a whole lot for me there's even a couple of band tracks you know that they're good but i don't really care that much about ruben remus uh uh, i don't care that much about long distance operator you know they're fine much like a few other of his records it's it's like a standalone sort of curio in his catalog there's nothing like this it does scratch a particular itch for me like i said i'm not always in the mood for it but when i am some of it's a nostalgia thing some of it is a is a fascination thing and and a lot of it is truly enjoying it you know it 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 does break a string spoiler alert it does break a string of five star records for me that we've we've just had um but it is I think really fascinating. I was so interested. I expected anything uh, on your end from this is the biggest pile of dog shit I've ever listened to, to, oh my God, this is the most fascinating thing I've ever heard. You. It sounds like you're... I'm in the middle. Somewhere I'm in the middle. To... Less less towards dog shit, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear that there's some enjoyment and a lot of appreciation here. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of enjoyment here. It's very interesting, again, on an academic Bob Dylan level. Sure. Um, And very interesting to see the band, which 
you know, I knew they had collaborated with Bob Dylan before, but when we did the band discography on the channel, I had no idea that they were so entwined with, with Bob. Um, so it is interesting for me to hear this and I, I like the band, but I only like the band pretty much in the sixties after that, they kind of lose me. So I do really like hearing some of these early, um, early, you know, band tunes, pre-band tunes, yeah. uh, like Yazoo Street Scandal and Bessie Smith, which actually that one might be post. So that's one where yeah. it's, it could have been 68, could have been 67. It's possible it was 1970. Could, yeah, it could be 75. <laughs> You know, hearing that's great. Hearing the original versions of Tears of Rage, uh, This Wheels on Fire is cool. And hearing the original songs, You Ain't Go Nowhere, Nothing Was Delivered, which I've loved since I heard them from the, the birds. It's really interesting to hear the original takes on those, even if I don't, you know, particularly love the Dylan uh, ones, especially the his delivery leaves me a little cold on those two. But I, I think it's a very interesting album. It wasn't like climbing a mountain listening to this. It was it was breezy and easy. There's some fun songs on here, some strong band songs, some classic Dylan songs. So I'm probably around four stars, high three and a half for the whole experience. Nothing, nothing I hate here. I'll take it. Technology magic. Yeah, I think um regardless of how big a fan you are of Bob or the band, which, you know, I happen to be a, a massive fan of, of both, you know, and, and you're a big fan of those two band records and you like and, and appreciate some Dylan stuff. But if you're just a a fan of popular music and you're interested in the history of it all, I, I think that's where, you know, some of these fans who view the basement tapes as the be all end all have a point um, in the sense that like, you know, some of these songs are just so embedded in the culture. You Ain't Going Nowhere is is a standard, you know. Uh, Crash on the Levee has been done by everyone. Mighty Quinn and I Shall Be Released, they're not on this 1975 record, but they were recorded during the sessions. They were bootlegged along with the other stuff. They were, you know, given out to other artists. I Shall Be Released um, is right up there with... Uh, the weight and wagon wheel at the top of the list of songs ruined by white people, um, which sucks because they're incredible songs. I love the weight. I love I, I shall be released, but my God, I, I, I don't need at the end of like every concert ever where it's like, oh, let's bring our friends up on stage. What do we do? Oh, we'll do these. I digress. Unbelievably, I mean, some of the most important sessions of all time. That is amazing. And yeah, however that translates to your enjoyment of listening to it, I can I can kind of understand. I know some people who the basement tapes is like their least listened to Dylan, like they want nothing to do with it because it is so unpolished. And um, but I I do love it and I'm I'm certainly fascinated by it. And you know, even even though ultimately it was some of the other stuff that truly made me a fan. I mean, it's it's always going to be the first Bob I ever heard. And uh, that's that's pretty important for me. Shortly after they're done, Bob goes back to Nashville, hooks back up with Charlie McCoy and Kenny Buttry, who both played on Blonde on Blonde, and records what will eventually be his next studio album, John Wesley Harding, which is the next album we'll talk about. So I don't know if you have any familiarity with this record whatsoever. Um I'm sure that at the very least, you've gone back and listened to his version of All on the Watchtower, so you can use it to say, well, look how much better Hendrix's version is, which I, I don't disagree with, but we'll get to that. Um, but now that we've listened to the Basement Tapes, and you have an idea of what Bob's just gone through personally and, and musically, I'd say that you should keep in mind how that informs this record a little bit not so much musically I, I encourage you as much as you can to really pay attention to the storytelling on John Wesley Harding because almost every single song is a character study and like we've heard in the basement tapes there's not much of any of that psychedelic writing 
but it's still very well thought out, intentional writing, intelligent writing, a lot of biblical imagery going on. This is another one. I kind of have no idea what you're going to think of it. I don't know if you've already listened to it, but it comes out at the end of 1967. And when we think of 1967, we think of Sergeant Pepper and Jefferson Airplane and The Doors and and Hendrix and you know the Summer of Love and and all this stuff and and then we know getting into 68 we get some of the more stripped back stuff from some of those other groups from other groups like the band who are popping up for the first time you know we the general public we back in 19 late 67 68 haven't heard the songs that we just talked about so I'm interested for you to hear John Wesley Harding knowing that it was recorded after this stuff and that it was released there at the very tail end of 1967. So yeah, I think it's it's going to be fun. I am excited for that one, especially now listening to the basement tapes because I knew that it was sort of a stripped down back to basics kind of thing at the end of 67, which like you said, like no one else is really doing that yet. 68, you kind of have everybody doing that. Uh, you got Beggar's Banquet and the White Album and their kind of down-home songs that made its way onto that one. Uh, you have Sweetheart of the Rodeo. So you do have like that sort of reaction against this psychedelic, sprawling pop stuff that came out in 67. And plus the reaction, plus the influence of, of everything we just talked about. Right. And so hearing these basement tapes, I'm like, okay, so now this makes sense for John Wesley Harding. Uh, it makes sense for the band Music from Big Pink, which would be 68, but probably around the same time as John Wesley Harding-ish. So About, yeah, I think. So that makes me very intrigued to hear John Wesley Harding. I also am intrigued because in the, the big Bob Dylan book, uh, all the songs... Uh, the headline for the John Wesley Harding section is the first biblical rock album. I, I find very cool. I really am interested in like that biblical, not, you know, not Christian rock, but the yeah. way that, that these artists kind of took things from the Bible. Yeah. Like the, the hymns almost on the birds stuff counterculture to the counterculture of excess that was going on in the summer of love the fact that he's taking all this stuff from the bible and i'm interested to see you know if he's going all revelation style or, or what where he's where he's cribbing from but dylan was a great borrower and manipulator of texts like that and you you saw some of the bible kind of i think peeking into his earlier work because it's it's interesting stuff so the first biblical rock album that kind of gets uh, gets me going there. Well, well, without making this a full on theology podcast, um, you know, re regardless of, of what anyone's uh, religious beliefs are or aren't, I mean, it's a great story. You know, it's, it, it, there's so much to be taken from that. And I'm, I'm glad that that headline says the first biblical and not the first religious, because I don't think it's not a religious record. We'll, we'll get to the religious records. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, truly just a lot of the imagery, a lot of the storytelling, the way that he shapes these characters, the way that he sort of puts them in these different situations. It is so, so different than what he's done in the past. And I have, a, I kind of have a, a my own, theory for my own themes that I sense three upcoming records including John Wesley Harding John Wesley Harding is the first of what I can say I don't think that Bob himself was trying to make a trilogy of, of these concept records but I view John Wesley Harding Nashville Skyline and New Morning kind of as a particular trilogy in my head and I'll discuss that more when we get to the final one but he's embarking on a lot of things here for the first time i will say be be forewarned it says the first biblical rock album it's it's not rock r o r a w k um most of the record is bob charlie mccoy on bass and kenny buttry on drums and then nick drake lends uh 
some pedal steel to a couple songs, um, but it's very, very, very stripped down. Um, I believe he actually approached Robbie Robertson and, and Garth Hudson to say, hey, I just recorded these tracks. Can you guys overdub some guitar and organ for me? And they listened to them and they said, no, it's perfect as it is. Just like Fiona here, perfect as she is. So yeah, don't go into it. You know, you're not you're not about to hear Cream or The Who or anything like that. But I I think we have a very another very interesting episode in our hands coming up. Well, I am looking forward to that one. Just even on an academic level, again, learning about the history, the roots of all this music and history of rock and roll in the '60s. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll give John Wesley Harding a shot. I know uh, all along the Watchtower. And I'll have plenty to say about that one. And Jimi Hendrix, mostly. But I I am most one like, song I know. Listen, I'm most likely not going to disagree with you on on your feelings. The only the only thing I'll say. And if our, our if our buddy. Miroslav is watching. I know that's his favorite Dylan song, so I hope he's not throwing tomatoes at the screen right. Now. Yeah, Miroslav, the metalhead, his favorite favorite Dylan song is this this tame version of All on the Watchtower. But I, although I don't expect you to fall massively in love with it and say, "Oh my God, it's better than Hendrix's version," and I misunderstood it all these years, I think it's going to make sense to you in the in the grand scheme of the record. I think that will make you enjoy it and appreciate it a little bit more i like the hendrix version better too we'll talk about that more next week though. <laughs> all right good 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 i'm glad we're all sane here unlike some people i know jason also prefers the dylan but he doesn't like hendrix so the hell does he know mm. anywho anywho that's that's enough bob dylan for for today we're done with the basement tapes we're out of the basement we're back into the the woods with john wesley harding here or whatever is it a woodsy album is it a uh very very woodsy, very woodsy recorded okay. recorded in the woods here in nashville okay well there we go perfect um all right if you enjoyed our talk about the basement tapes uh give this video a like subscribe to the channel we release one of these new dylan podcasts every couple of weeks or so we're just working our way through the whole discography we'll be here for another four or five years just trudging along here. Leave your thoughts on the basement tapes. Are you one of the just absolute in love with it? Are you the Robert Christgau? He gave it an A plus back in 1975, interestingly enough. Or, you know, you, you like it for what it is. You don't like it. You think it's a black spot on Dylan's uh, discography. Let's, let's see what you think. Leave them in the comments. And, uh, you know, check us out on social and all that good stuff. And uh, we'll see you next time here on Taste Like Music.